Hello and a very warm welcome. We are fortunate, are we not, that we live in a time where if you are in pain, you can take a pill to get rid of it. But what if the pills become the problem? In America, 130 people every day die from an opioid overdose. Why has it become the country's deadliest addiction? round table with me David Foster. Your pain goes away but there's another problem you cannot then do without the drugs. In the USA which consumes almost 70 percent of the total global opioid supply the question is who is feeding these habits and can they be stopped? Opioid drug addiction kills more in the US each year than guns or breast cancer. 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. The US National Institute on Drug Abuse says even opioid pain relievers prescribed by a doctor can lead to addiction. Last year, the Office for National Statistics said UK deaths linked to the synthetic opioid called fentanyl had increased by 29%. President Trump is pushing the idea of non-addictive painkillers as a solution to the US epidemic. We give away billions and billions of dollars a year, and we're going to be spending lots of money on coming up with a non-addictive solution. Will governments find a way to end this addiction, or must the pharmaceutical industry and doctors take more responsibility? So let the conversation begin. Joining us from New York, we have Whitney Brown from the Drug Policy Alliance, not very far away in New Jersey, Indra Sidambi, founder and medical director at the Center for Network Therapy. With me at the round table, we have recovering opioid addict Nikki Hari and Eitan Alexander, founder of the UK Addiction Treatment Center, himself a recovering addict. We'll come to you two in, in just a moment, if we may, but, but let's go to the United States. Indra, can I ask you, first of all, I mean, heroin, is an opioid drug, but that's not really what we're talking about here. What, what drugs are, are the big problem there at the moment? Uh, the fentanyl is the biggest problem right now. Recently, uh, in the past year, we have been seeing overdose and death from fentanyl. Everything that patients are, like people are using today, is being laced with fentanyl. And fentanyl is a deadly drug, as we know. It's 50 to 100 percent potent, more potent than heroin. It is more dangerous, in your opinion, than heroin? That's right. In what sense? Uh, it is a very, very, very potent one, meaning 50 to 100 times more effective than heroin. That means the narrower the window of overdose, even a slight increase in the use can lead to overdose and death. Extraordinary. Let's go to New York now and to Whitney there. I remember reporting from the United States in the late 80s, early 90s on the massive drug problem, but it was mostly cocaine, um, crack cocaine, uh, meth. It wasn't opioid addiction. So where did this problem first arise? So, first of all, there always has been heroin use in the U.S. I do want to clarify that. But this particular overdose crisis has been driven in part by the use of prescription drugs, particularly OxyContin, which were marketed widely as an effective pain reliever, and they are a pain reliever. But their, dependent, their risk of dependency was not well understood, um, and so people became addicted to it. When that realization happened and they started cutting access to the drug because people were becoming dependent, they then turned to heroin, which they bought on the illegal market. And then, as the previous speaker mentioned, increasingly heroin and other drugs, including cocaine and meth, are being cut by fentanyl. And the fent people don't know that they're taking the fentanyl. It's extremely strong. It causes you to stop breathing almost immediately. And unless people have access to Narcon, which uh, can reverse the uses of it, you end up with people dying. Why in particular is this a problem for the northeast of the United States? Um, in, in places like Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Maine. West Virginia is a different case, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But why, why those relatively affluent states? Well, I think there are two different elements here. One, there's just a factual element that in what 
east of the Mississippi, people ingest uh, powder cocaine, which is easily cut by fentanyl. And so you'll see that most of the states with the highest rates of overdose deaths that are related to adulteration through fentanyl in the use of heroin are actually from eastern U.S. In terms of what drives um, addiction and substance use disorder, I think we really need to look at the the economic uh, issues, hopelessness, access to pain medicine, that is a critical issue. When the war on drugs was first declared, it was because um, veterans were coming back from Vietnam. And of course, as you know, the U.S. has been engaged in two very long-term wars. And so you have a lot of different factors that are driving um, problematic drug use and leading to substance use disorder. Okay, Indra, then we'll come back to the studio. Indra, these drugs are needed though, aren't they? Yes. So what do you do if you, if you clamp down on them? Uh, see, uh, for pain, for a chronic pain, you don't need to be treating patients with this kind of medication. There are other medications that we can use which are non-addictive. Uh, but then for uh, you know, illnesses like cancer and uh, you, you know, uh, deadly um, situations, that's when we are looking at opiate uh, medication. But then what happened was in the late 1990s, there was a push for uh, recognizing pain as a fifth vital science. And so this, you know, trickled down to this problem today, like over uh, identifying with pain with the patients and prescribing more and more prescription to address the pain has really driven this problem to this place. But then we have already seen regulations of uh, the doctors writing prescriptions. And so uh, I see more and more like, you know, people turning to the uh, street drugs like heroin or the breast pills these days, which is laced with fentanyl and the patients really don't understand what they're taking. And that has really driven this overdose and death. Okay, well, I would like to examine in more detail in just a few minutes um, who is behind this, pushing it, if you'll excuse the expression, in, in terms of its um, marketability. But Nikki, tell me about your addiction to opioids, knee operation, and then? So basically when I was a teenager, I was having a lot of issues with my knees um, and the doctor, because um, I was 17, 18 at the time, um, put me on cocodamol, which is mainly paracetamol with codeine. So there would only be like eight milligrams of, yeah. of codeine and 500 milligrams of paracetamol. Um, and as the pain was getting worse, it just wasn't touching the side. It wasn't helping with the pain. Um, I ended up seeing a consultant, having surgery. Um, after the surgery, I was then um, given coding um, and, and tramadol um, as pain relief. When did you realise that you couldn't do without this? Do you know what? It wasn't until about 15, 20 years later. And I had no idea. Them all of the time. I hadn't. Not continuously. It was a slow progression. Um, when I stopped taking them the first time, uh, I, I didn't realise that what I was actually feeling was withdrawal. I thought it was just the pain coming back. Um, but I didn't do anything about it. I didn't start taking more. But it wasn't until I had further knee operations and was given a stronger dose of codeine or tramadol and I realised then, well, I didn't realise at the time until I got into recovery yeah. that I, I was now addicted and the pain and sweating and shaking that I was feeling was actually withdrawal from the opioid We're itself. talking a little bit, if we may, about um, some of the physical dangers that there are with this. But, Eitan, if I can come to you now, the stories you've heard out of the United States, are there parallels here in the United Kingdom? Um, absolutely. Over in the US, you have essentially big pharma that goes out and, and they go out to the various hospitals and um, MDs that... Um, that would, you know, this is the this is a good thing, good product. That you know, you go and see your doctor. I'm in pain. Okay, this will help alleviate that. And the same thing as we have that over here. If I go to my doctor when I say, doctor, doctor, I'm depressed. You know, I can't stop drinking. He hears the words depression. He then he'll prescribe SRIs, and the SRIs aren't addictive. They're not going to work with alcohol. But in the same breath, I'm I'm a physician. I'm here, I'm trained to go and medicate and make your problem better. In some instances, it can be that I can numb the problem, but I'm not curing the problem. And the problem is still there. 
but which creates if, another problem. But they, they are pressed for time. Uh, they do have an easy solution there. What should they do? I, th I think there needs to be, obviously, in, 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 in America, there is now a huge awareness around the opioid problem. Over in the UK, it's only just starting to come out where people are starting to, to talk about it because it's a, it's, a, it's, it, it's a legal medication. How can it be a problem? But in the States, what's, what's gone on is, is that I, I now have a problem with this medication. My, my doctors now turn around and say, I can't have this anymore. I now go and move on to something else, whether I buy it on the internet or whether I buy it from the street mm -hmm. corner or however it is, because ultimately opioids medication is a currency. So if I can go and get my medication from a GP, all of a sudden I have a currency to go and sell on. Same with bitcoins, if you like. See, this is the problem. The, there isn't enough time and money and resources on the NHS to investigate what, their problem, what the problem is. Essentially what they're doing is sticking a plaster over, over a wound and not actually treating the wound. What and do you think they should have done with you then in the first place when you said, I'm in such pain, I need something? I think, um, you know, when you go and see a GP, you get a 10, 15 minute slot. Um, we should say GP means general practitioner, general practitioner. family doctor here. In family America. doctor, correct. Um, they don't have the time, the resources, or really the knowledge. You know, they don't specialise in a particular area. So, to give a painkiller can be can be quite easy to do. I think what I, they should have done was um, maybe given paracetamol, Nurofen come back in a month, see how it goes. You okay. know, we have so so there, there are ways round this, Indra, uh, in which you can use non-opioid pain relievers. Why isn't that happening? Uh, that's because, as I said, you know, uh, doctors wanted to make the patient comfortable. When they come in with pain, that has to be addressed and then they start prescribing. And also there is a difficult time because for a non um, the alternative treatments are not being covered by insurance most times. So they are like, uh, you know, constrained with what they have and they want to help the patient. So there was a, a misunderstanding about the addictive nature of these medications. So there was a big portion, people were writing prescriptions. And there's been like doctors who have been doing it in spite of having the knowledge that this is a quite addictive medication. So, but, you know, there's a mix of both. Okay, I, I, I'm trying to get to the basis of why this has happened, why, why non-opioids um, could have been used and, but opioids were used instead. And, and doctors would be experts in this. You would, you would hope and you would expect that they would know in advance of the dangers here. Am I, am I wrong in saying that? Uh, slightly there should be a clarification in that. In medical school, we, the doctors in general are not given education about these pain um, treatment and the pain medication. So what happened was addiction was not thought in depth. Only now in America, we are like looking more into integrating these in, in the medical um, school and also with the residency training. So all doctors have been trained um, uh, you know, to a point about at least understanding these medications are deadly, uh, only uh, you know, in the recent years. Whitney, I want to talk about why doctors are so willing these days to put these drugs out there, not just because they are effective, but because they are being paid to do so by pharmaceutical companies, correct? Some anyway. So there have been in, yes, there have been investigations that show that uh, organiz, pharmaceutical companies such as Pharma, uh, Purdue Pharma, which is the creator and distributor of OxyContin, which is one of the drivers of the uh, epidemic in the US, um, marketed directly to doctors and some of them they became what they called super subscribers. There also were pill mills that were set up. We saw those in West Virginia. Um, so you actually have the marketing by the pharmaceutical company to encourage distribution of it. Um, and but more to the point, and I think this is really critical, it's the government's responsibility, the Food and Drug Administration, to actually know what the dependency risk of a new drug are. And they relied on Purdue Pharma to tell them what the uh, dependency risk is rather than themselves investigate that. And so that's a critical aspect. And one other thing I just want to interject, there are some interesting studies that are coming out now in the US that show that states that allow medical marijuana for the treatment of pain have much lower rates of overdose. 
whether it's a cause and effect or, or correlation, we still need to understand that. But I know there's a debate going on in the UK about medical marijuana. Absolutely. And in the US, yeah. Yeah. Um, medical, medical marijuana is associated with lower overdose rates because you can turn to something that is not addictive, um, that can manage pain. Um, there are going to be times when it ha absolutely is fentanyl. For breakthrough cancer pain, we need fentanyl. Let's be clear about that. But there may be chronic condi pain conditions and even some acute pain conditions that medical marijuana can address. Okay, you, you guys I mean, in the studio, the, yeah, your turn. I mean, the, the, in regards to medical, medical marijuana, uh, I think that it's only just been legalized. It's only just been started to where it's been accessible. So there's enough data to go out there and and say, well, okay, this is helping the situation, not making it worse. You know, as you said originally, you know, the state's been in two wars. You know, but back in Vietnam, it, we have a lot of data to go and track and say, well, okay, the, potentially this is uh, there, there's a correlation between the war and and and, and a rise in opioid addiction. But in regards to people going through, instead of looking at the problem themselves in the States, there's a, there's a move towards something, you know, MA, medical assisted treatment. So they're coming away from the pill mills themselves and saying, well, okay, we will give, keep giving you drugs and try and stabilize you whilst you go and get help to go and look at what the actual underlying root cause of the problem is. What about this marketing side of things? Do, do people in the UK get push doctors as much as they do? Let me just read a couple of bits to you. Um, 40 million in prescription opioid marketing, this is the United States, over 67,000 uh, doctors. And the study revealed that for each three additional payments made to physicians, meals, in kind, whatever, per 100,000 people, opioid deaths were up by 18%. So it looks like the things are very much linked here, and we'll get comment from you guys in just a moment in the, in the US, but is there the same sort of pressure on family doctors here or not? Essentially, it's the NHS. So you would go to the NHS first, and they would it would come through that way. As well as, you you have a each practice is an individual business themselves. So people would go around and look at what's on the list and what's not, and and it's a combination of everything. In the states, it's an insurance-based market. Over here, we are if you want socialized medicine. So they look at it. So there's not the same sort of pressure. Potentially. Okay, Nikki. What about? Yeah, you want to say whatever you want to say. Yeah, I mean, I'm so, it's only now that um, while well, we're starting to see an increase um, at UCAT with with people phoning up with um, addictions to fentanyl, oxycontin, that was a drug that I'd always associated with America. It, it's but more here now. It's starting to. And you're the admissions manager at the treatment centre, I think. So you see everybody as they come in. So yeah, I basically we, we take we take the calls for you know over 200 calls a day of people making inquiries about addiction, um, and it's a very taboo subject because I was very blinkered when I was told I was a drug addict. I was mortified because a drug addict to me was someone that was, you know. Um, Come, come from poverty, was injecting heroin, was sleeping on park benches. You know, I, I, I was a mum, two children, you know, middle, middle working class person. I, I'm not a drug addict. You hadn't been in trouble, you know. No, no never. Blameless life, but you know what? almost it, blameless. But. After coming out of rehab and doing the counselling and the therapy, I've realised that actually drug addiction isn't a bad word. It's an illness. I wasn't, I didn't set out to become a drug addict. And I think people, because there's more awareness in the UK now, people are starting to realize that actually maybe I have got a problem. I've been on this medication for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Now that the NHS have prescribed them, where's the help of people getting off these drugs? That's, that's what worries me. Indra, I was just going to say, Whitney talked about the fact that the Food and Drug Administration regulatory body in the United States has an obligation here. Um, in, in terms of the laws being changed, President Trump says he's going to either get a handle on it or at least do his very best to get a handle on it with new bills. Uh, what is he proposing? How is the system going to change? Uh, he's trying to uh, take some control over this, but I don't see much of a change here. You know, on the contrary, 
uh, about the medical marijuana. Medical marijuana, we need to define what we mean by that because I see patients who come in with a medical marijuana card, using marijuana from the street, getting high, and then using this card to protect themselves from the legal repercussions. So I don't see this as really helping. Yes, overdose from opiates can be stopped by using medical marijuana. There is not enough study to prove that. And I see. But it, but sorry, actually, sorry to be direct about this, but what is Trump proposing that could help solve this problem? Uh, he's trying to. Uh, propose that these kind of um, fentanyl coming into the country has to be stopped, number one. He's also talking about, uh, you know, uh, illegal drugs not to be uh, floating around and also to curtail the doctors from really prescribing and go after the pharmaceutical companies. So uh, is it the pharma companies that are to blame or, or is the problem elsewhere? Uh, it's not one one thing you know it is a mixture of both see the pharmaceutical companies are approaching the doctors who have been um, in medical field and we need to be more uh, you know answerable for prescribing what we do and also you know i think the most important factor here is the physician we need to be trained well we need to be taking some um, you know authority here and try to say this is not the right way of practicing but it's a double-edged sword essentially because in the states you know big pharma and the insurance companies, they back the government. If you don't have them on side, you have a problem. So ultimately, you know, they don't want to look at big pharma want to go and sell drugs, and the insurance companies don't want to treat addiction so because it's so expensive, so it's, I'm going to go and treat it with medication, which is the cheaper option, which is covered by my policy in the States. So they're going to... Everyone's steering towards that way instead of saying, well, okay, let's go and treat the problem and, and what the problem is. Okay, we need the, the cheap option rather than the right option, is what Eitan is saying. Well, what I would argue that any government can do, and we're trying to get this done in the United States, is to uh, first adopt comprehensive harm reduction practices, which save lives today. And these are things like uh, syringe access programs, a Good Samaritan laws that mean that if you're taking drugs with somebody who's overdosing, you can call the police and you won't be arrested for the drug use yourself. It's drug checking kits so you can see whether the drugs that you're taking have been adulterated with fentanyl. These and uh, safe consumption sites would, which have been used in Canada and different places in Europe. What that does is save lives today. And, and sorry, sorry to jump option. in, but I, w I want to get your point there, but you, you mentioned to our researcher that we should take a look at what's happened in Portugal. Tell us, yes, tell us what and why. Yes, absolutely. So in the late 1990s, Portugal had a very high overdose rate and very high HIV rate as a result of injection drug use. And in 2001, they adopted a law that decriminalized possession and use of all drugs, every drug on the market. Um, and in the time since that happened, their overdose rates have plummeted, their HIV rates have plummeted, their hep C rates have plummeted. Uh, what they basically said is do not look at drug use as a criminal justice issue, look at it as a public health issue. And the focus of the government now is when people use drugs, because there's still an illegal drug market in Portugal, they can, if they um, come in contact with the criminal justice system, they're sent to uh, what's called a dissuasion committee to see if their use of drugs is a, a substance use disorder or whether it's just whether their use is recreational okay. and non-problematic. Time, time is an issue, but Whitney, thank you very much indeed. I want to ask two recovering addicts in the studio. I mean, you're aware of what's been going on in Portugal, sure. but do you think that is the way that we should go, that we will eventually go? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially, it's, 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 you look at it and you think, well, okay, that's great that they're, it's decriminalized. But in the same breath, you know, the prescription drugs aren't illegal either. And so therefore, g going back to the, the problem of the prescription, the pill mills essentially, and the, the doctors pushing out drugs, it's, it, that problem is not going to be solved by decriminalizing you know, the use of heroin or the use of cocaine or, you know, ultimately, the, that's always, that, that's underground, whether it's brought above ground, okay, the, the other problem is still there and not being addressed.
Vicky, very quick word. If, I'm sorry to push you. No, so, I mean, I wasn't aware that actually what they have in Canada, where they have um, bases where you can take the drugs to be tested. My son told me that we actually have it here in the UK. Um, but I don't think if you're about to take a pill, which, like Aitan said, you probably would have bought on the black market, uh, on the internet, you're going to, if you're in that state at the time, you're not going to go to one of these... Um, booths and, and get your drugs checked, so it, it's quicker just to take the drug. What I'd like to see is a solution to people that are now addicted to opioids. Yeah, and we, I was saying I, back in the 80s I was reporting on this in a slightly different way. Mm. Um, I would, I'm terribly sorry, but I think in about 15 years, if I'm still working, I'll be doing exactly the same thing about something we haven't even thought of today. Um, to Whitney, to Indra, thank you very much for joining us on Round Table. Thank you. Your, your, your thoughts, your ideas were invaluable. Appreciate it very much. And to you two, good luck with all of the work that you do. And thank you very much for watching this edition of Round Table. From me, David Foster, from everybody who made this programme possible, we hope to see you next time. Goodbye for now. <laughs>